Uh, good afternoon. I'm Associate Professor Greg Feely from the Australian National University and I'm one of a number of speakers at the Australia 360 event this morning at Old Parliament House. It's my pleasure to be joined by my colleague from the Department of Political and Social Change at ANU, uh, Eve Warburton, uh, who's an expert on Indonesian politics and research development. And uh, one of the themes in the session that we've just come from has been the state of Indonesian democracy and Eve has just presented a very interesting paper talking about uh, democratic regression, in other words the view that Indonesian democracy is in decline and this very much runs counter to the public perception that Indonesia has been a strong, continues to be a strong democracy. So I wonder Eve if we might begin our discussion by you telling us some of the key indicators of this democratic um, backsliding in Indonesia. Sure, thanks Greg. So um, I pointed to three sources of Indonesia's democratic fragility, uh, one of which emerged in 2014. And that was this rise of a kind of uh, neo-authoritarian populism in Indonesia. It's a brand of politics that is anti-democratic, that explicitly challenges some of the uh, sort of foundational democratic institutions, such as elections. Uh, and it's accompanied by a sort of nativist and xenophobic nationalism. And uh, the person who most clearly expressed that particular brand of populism was Prabowo Subianto. Now, even though he lost that election uh, in 2014 against the, uh, the current president, Joko Widodo, uh, he lost only narrowly. So he, uh, he garnered a lot of support from the Indonesian population. Uh, he continues to be a really important part of the Indonesian political landscape. And most analysts believe he will run again in 2019 against Jokowi in, in Indonesia's fourth uh, direct presidential election. So that's sort of one ongoing source um, of concern for observers of Indonesia's democracy. And the second one uh, has been this sort of recent upswing in sectarian and Islamist mobilization. And perhaps that's something that you can speak to a little more because it's been the subject of a lot of um, interesting debate uh, amongst uh, observers of Indonesia. To what extent has this recent upswing in sectarian mobilization, uh, or, uh, to what extent does it really matter for the quality of Indonesia's democracy? I don't know if you want to comment on that, Greg. Yes, well, just to talk about some of the things that scholars are uh, uh, focusing on, and a lot of this particularly revolves around the Jakarta gubernatorial election uh, that was held earlier this year and the defeat of the incumbent governor Ahok, as he's commonly known, who is a Chinese Christian, and the really quite virulent sectarian campaign and racist campaign that was run against him. And that has led to generate a lot of discussion about uh, Islamist mobilisation and that Islam would go from being a rather peripheral element in Indonesian politics, even though the great majority of Indonesians are Muslim, to being a, a central element as something that particularly can be used in the negative to bring down an incumbent. And as you said in your presentation, uh, there is a, a fear, particularly in, in, uh, on behalf of the current Indonesian president, Joko Widodo, that the same kind of tactics could be used against him. So uh, in your own view, Eve, do you think that's a strong likelihood that, that we will see the replication of these kinds of um, Islamic mobilisation and um, attacking of political minorities and the like in, in future Indonesian elections? Um, I, I do think that we will see, um, once again, attempts by some of the mainstream political elite uh, to mobilise those sorts of sectarian ideas because it did work so well um, in the Jakarta election. However, the second question is whether it would work so well again in another situation. Would it work that well against a Muslim, a popular Muslim president such as Jokowi? Um, and that's what we don't know. But even, I guess, the, the, the notion that uh, that mainstream politicians who don't necessarily support that sort of radical agenda themselves are more than willing to coalesce with and to form coalitions with uh, those sorts of fringe radical groups um, and, to, and to legitimate those sorts of fringe radical groups is concerning in and of itself. Um, but I guess one final point that is worth talking about is um, the way in which the Jokowi administration responded um, to, that, to the Islamist mobilizations because uh, they clearly did see, or uh, the Jokowi administration has clearly um, seen that as a threat to, to his own political um, stability. Um, and 
he's responded by coming out uh, and staunchly defending Indonesia's pluralist and its secular foundation. Uh, but he's done so using tools that are uh, necessarily undemocratic and illiberal. So he's issued um, a presidential decree in order to kind of avoid all the checks and balances that Indonesia has under certain laws uh, to protect the rights of people to organise, um, to express their opinion. Um, and he's done that in order to try and manage right-wing Islamist organisations but he's done so in a way that in and of itself constitutes a threat to Indonesia's democracy. I suppose one question would be, Jokowi appears very much to be a pragmatic political leader. He's not someone who thinks a great deal about political principles or norms, but rather what he needs to do to be successful. And do you think he's, he's, he's winning with his campaign to intimidate or to undermine a potential Islamist opposition to him. Will he pull this off, this criminalisation of Islamic leaders and this use of, of legal instruments in order to put pressure on Islamists? It's very hard to know now what impact this will have because on the one hand, you know, observers of Indonesian politics have been very, well, very critical of Yudhiyono, President Yudhiyono, for not doing enough, in fact, to deal with uh, sort of sectarian and um, Islamist groups in Indonesia, the most radical uh, groups in Indonesia, that he sort of sat on his hands um, and even invited them into the fold in some ways. Um, and so to see Jokowi coming down hard on these sorts of groups, um, to the extent that he's criminalising some of their leaders, um, planning on banning their organisations. Some people might breathe a sigh of relief and say, finally, uh, we have a president who's doing something about it. But the risk, first of all, I already mentioned the risk to Indonesia's democratic institutions, but the risk is also that you alienate um, particular constituencies within the Indonesian population, those who might not support their radi these radical agendas, but that might feel some sort of sympathy uh, for um, for uh, their Muslim brethren. Um, and also that you might drive these groups underground, you might radicalise people who were not at the moment radicalised. Um, and, and so those are the big questions and I'm not sure that we have the answers to those questions now. I'm not sure if you have an opinion on that very question, <laughs> Greg. Well, perhaps one thing to just take up from what you've said, Eve, is you mentioned a former president, Cecilia Bambang Yudhoyono, and he was one of the people widely accused of disbursing large sums of money, perhaps millions of dollars of money, to mobilise people against Ahok. And certainly in his public statements, he gave succour to people who were using racist or sectarian um, messages against the, the, the incumbent Jakarta governor. And so this seems to be a good example of what you were talking about before, where the people who are helping to orchestrate this Islamist mobilisation are not themselves Islamist. Mm -hmm. Prabowo Subianto would be a good example of that, and most certainly Yudhoyono. It's well known that both he and his wife don't particularly like um, militant Islamists, they don't like the way they dress, they don't like their views, but he had a short-term political benefit from mobilising them because, among other things, in Yudhoyono's case, his son was one of the unsuccessful candidates in that Jakarta election. So I think that's one of the things that's interesting for us to see. Even if Jokowi succeeds, and he, he has formally banned now the organisation Hizbut Tahrir, and there's talk that other organisations might be um, targeted um, shortly. But those networks, whatever happens to the formal organ organisation, those networks can actually regenerate remarkably quickly. And uh, in an election campaign, if you have the suitable conditions, if, you, if someone can get traction with a message that the current government, say, Joko Widodo, is an anti-Islamic president, well then suddenly we can get the kinds of mobilisation that we had uh, in Jakarta. So, as you say, that's one of the things that we'll have to wait and see, but uh, very interesting things for us to follow.